Commence primary ignition. I'm going to show you a video from End Times Deception. Uh, it's been out on YouTube for quite a while, but it's about Protestantism and the papacy. But what's important about this is about the, the Temple of God. It's about the Antichrist and the Son of Perdition. Uh, the Temple of God is the body of Christ. Uh, if you'll go to chapter 11 in Revelation, uh, John has been given a read to measure the temple of God, body of Christ. Uh, this goes along with the seven churches because they are being measured to see who is worthy to not only escape the great tribulation but to be resurrected uh, at the rapture or the gathering, however you want to call it. Um, anyway, uh, he is measuring the body of Christ. That's the temple of God. It's not a building made with hands. Whatever they, they build in Jerusalem is just going to be a building. Uh, you know, maybe the uh, Pope will set himself up in it. But uh, at this point, it's just a building. It's just a synagogue of uh, Satan. It really has nothing to do as much with revelations as the fact that we already have an Antichrist and we already have a son of perdition. Uh, which is the Catholic Popes. Um, anyway, when John is told not to measure the outer court because it's been given to the Gentiles, the Gentiles are the unbelievers. The believers are the body of Christ, the temple of God, Israel, the bride. Um, she has many names just like Christ has many names. And so um, anyway, that's what's going on there. Uh, it's not talking about a building in Jerusalem. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to touch on that. Uh, Francis is very interesting. I hope you are watching this guy. He uh, has changed the Ten Commandments. He, uh, he makes statements like he should have been Jesus. He is bringing the LGBTQ aboard or under his umbrella. Uh, this spirit of Sodom and Gomorrah and uh, so he really is uh, kind of a conclusion or possibly a wrap up up to uh, or about the son of perdition. Uh, anyway I believe that the uh, I don't know if I said it before but the tribulation hour is uh, 2,000 years it started with the ascension of Christ it will conclude with the rapture and then the great tri tribulation will possibly be just three and a half years. Uh, but anyway, many things in Revelation has been fulfilled. Uh, we're looking at uh, in chapter 13 of the dragon, which I believe is China. She is trying to take over the world with her one belt one road um, she is uh, already probably in the Middle East I believe there are troops there but uh, the one belt one road will cross the great river Euphrates and it says in chapter 16 that it will be dry well the river Euphrates is dry today and this one belt one road is going to cross the Euphrates and make way for the kings of the east. And so we're seeing many things uh, coming to pass very quickly. Uh, things about Trump, uh, I, I, you know, I stand in the middle of the road about him. I know a lot of people either like him or hate him. I'm kind of in the middle. Uh, I do believe that God 
is using him to push everybody to the end. And uh, what's interesting about Trump is the fact that uh, he was educated in Catholic schools. Uh, Pence, the vice president, is a evangelical Catholic. And this new Supreme Court uh, justice that has been not, or what hasn't been nominated, or has been nominated. Anyway, he's a Catholic as well. And so the Catholics really are trying to set themselves up over not only the body of Christ, but the souls of men. So anyway, watch the movie, enjoy it, and uh, I'll come back in another video and share with you some uh, mind-blowing things that the Holy Spirit has showed me. Originally, the word Protestant was a reference to those who protested the claims made by the Roman Church. Even in the 19th century, Charles Spurgeon said, For truth's sake, our Protestantism must protest perpetually, no peace with Rome. But in times past, such teachings from the Albigenses, the Waldenses, and to a great extent, those of Wycliffe and the Lollards, were suppressed and nearly stamped out by the Crusades and Inquisitions. Yet with movable type and the printing of books and Bibles faster than the popes could burn them, the teachings of the reformers spread like a fire across Europe. But some claim that it was not simply the teaching of salvation by grace that brought the reform, but the recognition of the papal system as the fulfillment of God's greatest warnings to the church as set forth in the prophecies of the Bible. Was it this teaching that created such determination in men like Tyndale, Luther, and others? Protestant minister Dr. Ian Paisley writes, it has been claimed that when Luther recognized the papacy as antichrist, it was only then that the Reformation gained momentum. Yet Luther himself acknowledged that what he was teaching did not begin with him, but had been handed down from centuries earlier. He wrote, We are not the first to declare the papacy to be the kingdom of Antichrist, since for many years before us so many and such great men, whose number is large and whose memory is eternal, have undertaken to express the same thing so clearly and plainly believing that the papacy is antichrist was standard for reformed believers who claimed the pope was the prophetic fulfillment of the apostle paul's warning of that man of sin the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called god or that is worshiped so that he as god sitteth in the temple of god showing himself that he is god they held to this view because in the New Testament, the church is called the temple of God, and the popes were well known for exalting themselves in the midst of the church. Paul wrote, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Therefore, let no man glory in men. Early Christians and the Reformers were very familiar with the blasphemous declarations from the papacy, which were often the subject of intense debate, because from ancient times the popes had declared themselves to be equal to God. Jesus said, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your Father, which is in heaven. Yet the popes took to themselves the name Holy Father, along with all claims of authority that might be assumed by such a title. Pope Innocent III, who fathered the Inquisition, said, The Pope holdeth place on earth, not simply of a man, but of the true God. Meanwhile, Pope Nicholas said of himself, I am in all and above all, 
so that God himself and I, the vicar of God, hath both one consistory, and I am able to do almost all that God can do. I then, being above all, seem by this reason to be above all gods. Nicholas even claimed that the popes had the power to change the gospel itself, saying, Wherefore, no marvel, if it be in my power to dispense with all things, yea, with the precepts of Christ. But in the Bible, Jesus says, Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it, and no man openeth. The Apostle Paul warned that if any man or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed. Yet despite these biblical warnings, the popes repeatedly claimed they were equal to and above God, and were even called by Catholics our Lord God, the Pope. The Lateran Council, while addressing Pope Julius II, said to him, Take care that we lose not that salvation, that life and breath which thou hast given us. For thou art shepherd, thou art physician, thou art governor, thou art husbandman, thou finally art another God on earth. In the 19th century, Cardinal Giuseppe Sarto, who would later become Pope Pius X, declared, The Pope is not simply the representative of Jesus Christ. On the contrary, he is Jesus Christ himself, under the veil of the flesh. Does the Pope speak? It is Jesus Christ who is speaking. Hence, when anyone speaks of the Pope, it is not necessary to examine, but to obey. Jesus said of himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Yet Pope Pius IX blasphemously declared, I alone am the successor of the apostles, the vicar of Jesus Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. The popes have not only made claims to be God, but have insisted that salvation itself depends directly upon obedience to them. Pope Boniface VIII said, We declare, say, define, and pronounce that it is absolutely necessary for the salvation of every human creature to be subject to the Roman Pontiff. Pope Clement VI said, No man outside obedience to the Pope of Rome can ultimately be saved. All who have raised themselves against the faith of the Roman Church and died in final impenitence have been damned and gone down to hell. Even in modern times, Pope John the 23rd in 1958 declared, Into this fold of Jesus Christ no man may enter unless he be led by the sovereign pontiff and only if they be united to him can men be saved. In 1984, Pope John Paul II was quoted as saying, Don't go to God for forgiveness of sins. Come to me. The quote was based on a Los Angeles Times article which reported, rebutting a belief widely shared by Protestants and a growing number of Roman Catholics, Pope John Paul II dismissed the widespread idea that one can obtain forgiveness directly from God. Furthermore, according to traditional Catholicism, obedience to the papacy is said to be required no matter how dreadful the Pope might be. Catherine of Siena, one of the patron saints of Italy, whose mummified head is still preserved in Rome today, said, even if the Pope were Satan incarnate, we ought not to raise up our heads against him, but calmly lie down to rest in his bosom. He who rebels against our Father is condemned to death, for that which we do to him, we do to Christ. We honor Christ if we honor the Pope. Such demands for blind obedience 
were confirmed by the popes themselves, but confronted by the reformers. By men like Martin Luther, who said, The Pope, possessed by demons, defends his tyranny with the canon, See Papa, or Yes Father. This canon states clearly, if the Pope should lead the whole world into the control of hell, he is nevertheless not to be contradicted. It's a terrible thing that on account of the authority of this man, we must lose our souls, which Christ redeemed with his precious blood. Because of this evidence, Luther declared, I believe the Pope is the masked and incarnate devil because he is the Antichrist. It is important to understand that this belief was not just confined to Luther, but was held by all the reformers from John Wycliffe in the 14th century to Charles Spurgeon in the late 19th century. Spurgeon said, it is the bounden duty of every Christian to pray against Antichrist. And as to what Antichrist is, no sane man ought to raise a question. If it be not the popery in the Church of Rome, there is nothing in the world that can be called by that name. The Westminster Confession of Faith, along with the Savoy Confession, the Old Baptist Confession, and the Methodist views of John Wesley, all included the declaration that the Pope is that Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition, that exalteth himself in the church. This was also the belief of the men who translated the King James Bible. In their opening dedication, they commended the king for writing in defense of the truth, which hath given such a blow unto that man of sin as will not be healed. The view of the Antichrist, not as a single man, but of many men in a single office, was based in part on the teaching of John Wycliffe. In the Gospel of Matthew, the disciples asked Jesus, What shall be the sign of thy coming? and of the end of the world. Jesus said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Wycliffe believed that the many who say, I am Christ, are in fact the Pope's. The Pope's title, Vicarius Christi, literally means another Christ. Wycliffe concluded that Antichrist is thus a monstrous composite. In further explaining the Pope's title, author Dave Hunt writes, The Latin equivalent of the Greek anti is vicarius, from which comes vicar. Thus, vicar of Christ literally means Antichrist. But the view of the papacy as Antichrist is not widely held by Protestants today. Still, there are those who continue to uphold the Reformers' original beliefs. Perhaps it has something to do with this official Vatican portrait of the current Pope. It is called The Truth, The Way, and The Life, Portrait of His Holiness, Pope Benedict XVI. But can this really mean that in the modern world there are some who still believe the Pope to be equal to Christ and God? Mr. President, final question. Yes, sir. You said famously, when you looked into Vladimir Putin's eyes, you saw his soul. Yeah. When you look into Benedict XVI's eyes, what do you see? God. Good way to end the interview. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. My pleasure. Yes, sir. In contrast, Dr. Ian Paisley is a Protestant minister with a long history of opposing Rome's influence in Great Britain. He has been a member of the British and European parliaments and retired in 2008 as the first minister of Northern Ireland.
Paisley considers himself a modern successor of the reformers. What follows is typical of his preaching. The darkest days in church history were always the brightest days for the church of Jesus Christ. When they were burning, the saints of God, thank God the gospel burned with mighty fire. And thank God it was said in Scotland when they burned Patrick Hamilton, the first martyr of the Scottish Reformation, that everybody his smoke blew upon became a Christian and left old harlot, scarlet church of Rome. We need to discover that in the darkest day, God has victory for his people. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And thank God for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. In 1988, when Pope John Paul II delivered a speech at the European Parliament, Paisley opposed him, shouting the words of Archbishop Cranmer, who had been burned at the stake. Like the reformers of old, Paisley held up a sign and denounced the Pope as the Antichrist. Permit me to say how much I... you to stop this disturbance. There was another poster in his pocket for each one snatched away. The Pope, waiting with a text which spoke of Europe as the beacon of civilization, looked on with faint amusement. Mr. Paisley, I now exclude you from this house and for the remainder of the city. Mr. Paisley claims he was punched and that he later received a personal apology from the head of security for failing to protect him. The poster stated simply, John Paul II, Antichrist. I uh, am in the historic uh, succession of the reformers. I mean, uh, one wee lady wrote into the press and said I wrote the Confession of Faith and called the Pope the Antichrist. I mean, I was far from the first person who accepted the fact that the Church of Rome was a false church and therefore was the church as depicted in the, in the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation. Now, that is historic Protestantism. Paisley makes it clear that he still believes the Pope, or papal system, is the fulfillment of the biblical warnings about Antichrist. Yet it is only fair to acknowledge that many prophecy teachers today believe that the Antichrist is yet to come, but like the Popes, he will claim to be equal with God. But someday there will emerge a man, a man who proclaims that he is God. And, of course, according to the Bible, this will be the Antichrist. But he is a man. But the Bible says Satan will empower him. But for the Reformers, the Antichrist had already been revealed through the papacy. John Wycliffe was so convicted about it, he even said, why is it necessary in unbelief to look for another Antichrist? In 2 Thessalonians, when warning about the man of sin, Paul wrote, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Martin Luther believed that the reformers were themselves as the spirit of the Lord's mouth, and by preaching the word of God, they were consuming the papacy, even as fire consumes a bundle of wood. Luther wrote, For we must slay him with words, the mouth of Christ must do it. That is the way he is torn out of men's hearts, and his lies become known and despised. Let us be wise, thank God for his holy word, and be bold with our mouths. This is the way Christ is, through us, slaying the papacy. Luther believed that the papal antichrist would continue to be thus consumed until the Lord completely destroys him at Armageddon.